So that's when we were spotted by a spy plane. And my dad knew that um, as soon as he heard the noise of the spy plane, that within minutes the jets would arrive and the helicopter gunships would arrive. Uh, so he took me with him in his arm. He ran. I had no clue what was going on, but he ran really fast towards the village. He didn't return back to the bushes because I think he realized that he might endanger everybody else's life all the children and women who were hiding in, the, in those bushes. So we went to the village, he knocked on one door, he, that was closed, he found another house that was abandoned. And in that house, he was searching for somewhere. Uh, and I didn't know again what he was searching for. He found an oven on the ground and he took me in that oven uh, and then he hid me there in the oven. And within a minute or so, the uh, helicopter gunships and the jets actually arrived. First, the jets arrived and they started the bombardment. And we could actually feel the whole earth moving with every bomb that was coming down. We could actually feel the bullets and that was uh, being showered on us on the ceilings of the, the muddy house there. Of course, I'd, I'd close my eyes and my dad was he hugging me really tightly in that oven, trying to save me if anything had happened to him. And that's exactly what he told me as well that if anything happens to me, make sure you take your family and you take them back to Kabul, Afghanistan, so you don't go back to Pakistan. You go straight to there and tell your uncle to, to look after you and make sure you look after them. And I think that was one of the moments when I realized that actually I was second in command for the family as well, even mm -hmm. at five. But if anything happened to that, I had to take the, the leadership to, to lead my family in, in war. Doctor's Kitchen. Recipes, health, lifestyle. Where are you recording from today? Uh, from my uh, son's bedroom. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Where is he today? Oh, that's gorgeous, Zane. Is that, is that your first, first child? Yes. Zane. Zane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. We've got a small house, two bedroom, but you know, it's, you have to find a corner. You have to find all these little bits and pieces. Just Definitely, definitely, man. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll get started and say, I'm, I'm basically just going to ask you, a bunch of questions and just let you talk and just tell your story because it's and i mean this man it's so powerful for a number of reasons for people who want to go into medicine who feel that they need a step up who need motivation you know who might be refugees themselves like there's just so many elements of your story and the way it's been written and put together it's just incredible so i want to give you as much time to, to talk through it and we could talk about obviously the charity, uh, ways to support, uh, and anything else that you want to talk about as well. So, so yeah, man, this is this is really just your chance to speak to my audience, and I want to try and promote it as much and as much as possible. Um, that's very kind of you, Ruby. Um, that's uh, I think that what I'll do is I'll go chronologically from the beginning, yeah. start, and there will be themes that will come out uh, that I would like to summarize. For example, hope, um, dreams. Mm issues, refugee camp situations. So I think in that way we wouldn't mess uh, anything, but uh, if you want to focus more, um, you can stop me and then we can kind of like discuss, uh, for example, PTSD. We yep. talk, uh, I've made a note here of as well that how, for example, I had late night uh, uh, food habits. Uh, oh, really? <laughs> I had that. So for example, that is topic relevant here yeah, that we can discuss yeah, the connection between the mind and the nutrition and exercise and my coping mechanism for mental health as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. As well. So definitely. We'll go through them. Yeah. Because it seemed like okay. uh, exercise, particularly uh, Taekwondo, was was a really good avenue for you to try and help you get through your PTSD. And It was, Taekwondo was. Um, I learned actually kicks and uh, some of the moves from uh, Jackie Chan move, uh, movies. Oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> I learned some of really some of the kicks later on that when I was uh, being trained properly. Yeah, they were looking at some of my kicks. They were weird. Some of them were wonderful, but some of them were weird. And, <laughs> and the instructor, who was like, "Who taught you that kick?" <laughs> <laughs> Did you say Jackie Chan? <laughs> yeah, because I would just like to see that he could do that move. You know. <laughs> on the wall and then flip back and I was like I can do it too and then I was just like obviously I'll bash my head uh, I will fall on the floor and then my mom will get annoyed you know what is not from and hellos everywhere but kind of uh, but I learned some some really cool tricks and some not really cool I had to relearn some of the kicks the techniques back and, and so on but that's I think one of the mechanisms as well that during wartime we didn't have access to plane we didn't have access to outside we were not going to school much so yeah. we had 
something to entertain ourselves with uh, and at home that was one of yeah. the things kind of we're watching movies um, stay at home and then kind of create this imaginary world where everything was okay everything was fine for us um, yeah to separate uh, what was going on on the outside yeah do you see do you, do you think that still happens um today like whenever you see children on the news and, and my position is obviously from my sheltered home watching it on tv and i see children in during famine in in conflict zones and a lot of some obviously not not the atrocities and, and the apocalyptic scenes but sometimes you see kids and they are laughing and smiling and and jumping around in, in front of the camera and, and stuff like that and they they seem very very happy it do, do you see that as like a coping mechanism is, is, is it just like the way children are they can they can imagine and visualize that um that they're, they're, they're that's a very good point actually i think um it also applies to, obviously it applies to conflict zones but if you go mm. to where there's extreme poverty, um, for example, some parts in Africa, some parts in India, you actually see that those people have got a huge smile on them, so, on their faces. They, they will still interact with you. They'll be happy to receive you. They'll be happy to um, tell you about their lives, to tell you about what they're going on to do and so on. One, I think consciously, um, I'm not sure if it is one of their coping mechanisms, but subconsciously, they... One, they're born into that reality, of whether mm. it's the whether it's conflict. So for them to see somebody else coming and as a guest, or for them to see, uh, to find pleasure or to find comfort in in the small things that we take for granted in life, is actually what it's all about for them. Yeah, because we didn't know when the fighting would end or start. Usually, we would be in the cellars hiding from the daily rockets and the bombs. But some, when the fighting wasn't there, that was really a good day for us. And we will be smiling, we'll be happy. But in the grand scheme of things, if you look at it from the outside, you'll be saying, why are you happy about, you know, the conflict is still ongoing. But from today, we would find a burst of um, times where we could find comfort in each other. We find um, humor in small things. We would make jokes about small things. And that's how actually one of the, subconscious coping mechanism that humans have actually. Um, the one thing I've later on on reflection I've realized is that it's, humans have got so much potential in so many avenues. They've got so much resilience uh, that if need be, if you're pushed, uh, we can actually tap into them. We can use that resilience. Um, and, and I think that's something that I brought with me back when I came to the UK, what I'll talk about later on is yeah. that um, the, the idea of not to give up, the idea of always be pushing, that they will be better days, is actually stemming from that, of not having hope, not having anything, but then the next day there will be a hope uh, of so on. Yeah, yeah. That, then, uh, I was uh, born in uh, 1983 during the Afghan-Soviet conflict um, in Afghanistan. So I was born into war. I didn't have any other reality. That was my reality, when I, which I was born into. Um, and the first five years, um, I remember hiding with, with our family members in one room or another or in cellars uh, from the rockets, from the shelling, and also from the tanks that were kind of making noise outside for the helicopters, gunships, uh, and the planes, the Soviet jets making uh, noises in, in the air. But I had no clue what was going on, so I usually asked mom what's happening, and she would say, oh, it's just fireworks outside. It's nothing. So that was another way that how they would uh, try, parents would try to comfort us and did an amazing job uh, for us. And that's usually when we see parents trying to protect their families when, uh, in conflict zones, it, I'm absolutely blown away by the sheer resilience they have, by the sheer kindness they, they, they use uh, and their compassion and passion they, they use to protect their, their children and to provide for them in the extreme conditions. We didn't have a lot of things. Usually my mother, she would go out and find jackets on the street or uh, some clothes that were exported from uh, Europe or exported from Russia or from some other country uh, when kind of it's redundant here, but obviously in those countries, that's exactly what we used to wear. They would, they would be holes here uh, or tears and, and so on, but that didn't matter. What mattered for us was, were we actually warm in winter um, it went as um, the temperatures go beyond freezing uh, mm. 
also we didn't have a lot of food. Obviously, what um, were given to us was um, completely below standard, but that's what kept us going. Um, and parents, again, play a huge part in that, making sure that uh, we get the nutrition uh, as much as possible while starving themselves. Yeah. So after about five years, um, we decided, all of us, to go back to, to Pakistan. And the reason for that was because my father was fleeing from the military service. He couldn't be with the family. So we had to go and meet in uh, a location, a hidden location, which was another province. So we were living in uh, Kabul uh, in a capital. And my father was in hiding in Logar province, um, quite a few kilometers away from Kabul. And he would go back and forth to Pakistan to make some money, bring that money back during summertime when the heat was too much, He'd give that money to my mom. So she would support us and he would go back in hiding. And so finally they decided that it was too much for everybody. Mm. So we could go to, to Pakistan to live together. And that's where most of the refugees at that time went. Millions of refugees did fled to Afghanistan because of the ongoing conflict. So we took a very dangerous route because my, we couldn't go through the usual border. The usual border was closed. The families were not allowed to flee to Pakistan. So we had to use very dangerous routes through mountains, through um, rivers. And the journey was actually at night. And the reason for that was that any movement that was seen during the day, the helicopter gunships and the planes would come in and attack and destroy the families, children, uh, that was the same route used by the rebels at the time as well. So they wouldn't discriminate necessarily whether it was a rebel or uh, whether it was uh, a family that was uh, trying to flee conflict uh, there. Um, and it took about seven days, seven nights. Uh, we came under the attack about three times. And miraculously, we survived those attacks along the way. Um, and we made it to Pakistan uh, to a refugee camp. And that's when... We arrived, the rockets and the bombs and the shelling stopped, but the horrendous conditions in refugee camp actually started. There were mm. lack of uh, nutrition, lack of sanitation, um, no clean water for them. And um, they had to make use of whatever they had. So they brought very few clothes with them from, uh, uh, with their families from Afghanistan. Uh, and, uh, but what they would usually bring with them is that hope, that dream that, you know, we've survived a war now. We've, we're safe in Pakistan. Mm. Let's make us better. So they wouldn't kind of say that, oh, my God, we've come to this, these conditions. What do we do now? So they would always seem to think positively. And that was the attitude my parents had as well. They would tell us that, come on, although the conditions are really bad here, but at least we are safe. The bombs are not here. So that's kind of like positive, changing a, a negative situation into positive by hanging on to the small threads of hope here and there, but also using the, the small things, the day-to-day -day things that we usually um, take for granted, actually, here. Yeah, because uh, it, it, in, the, in the book, you describe your father as having this irrepressible, optimistic attitude. And I wonder if that was something that was distinct for, for him as a person, or is this something that you've noticed uh, in other families, in the refugee camps, and, and other people in general who, who've experienced the, the conflict zones in Afghanistan? That's a good point. I think uh, it was pretty distinctive for my father, um, but also I've seen that uh, trend actually in many people who lived through conflict, who lived through um, really adverse conditions. They do develop that sense of optimism, uh, trying not to give up. Uh, one, they may not have any other choice, either that or death or completely giving up on their families. Um, or alternatively, it's, uh, uh, it, it's something that's kind of, they've been pushed to build that attitude because of the environment, the conditions. But my, my dad seems to have that. Uh, he had that from a younger age, I think. Uh, he still has that with him whenever I consult him. I still do consult him for things as well. He's got a very um, optimistic uh, attitude to him, uh, telling me that everything will be okay. One day there will be peace. Uh, Afghanistan is still in, in, in war for more than four decades. Um, and he usually would listen to a radio, a small radio, telling us that uh, he's heard some good news, despite listening to it for an hour, listening to bad news. But he would still try to find that one bit of good news uh, on the radio and tell us that, oh, that there is uh, hope that we might be able to go back to Kabul, to Afghanistan, and there would be peace. 
yeah. in the camp when we were living there um, as a huge family of eight um, in one muddy room and uh, the conditions the temperatures were rising up to 45 degrees centigrade with little food uh, lack of sanitation wow. no clean and some rations that were given to us um, by um, the UN refugee agency um, that was what was kept us going but again I think despite all those conditions what on reflection I, I find amazing is the hospitality of the local people that's I think where humanity matters as well they felt they knew that we were suffering and back in Afghanistan and that we had fled war so they did show us compassion that our neighbors didn't have much uh, the local Pakistani people didn't have much but whatever they had they would try to share with us for example we didn't have electricity and uh, when we moved from a refugee camp to um, another area called Badabira and the reason for that was because I contracted tuberculosis so we had to relocate so I remember our neighbor um, gave us electricity because we couldn't afford electricity and there was no electricity there. And they would also allow us to use some of the, the clean water they had uh, or many other things. So these are the small things that I'm mentioning here, but how the refugees obviously integrated back in Pakistan. They started giving back to the local communities, they built shops, they built businesses, uh, but also the people, uh, local people from um, whatever city people were living at, they would be welcoming refugees. They would be trying to make them as comfortable as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, they, they became sort of a, a community that you wouldn't be able to distinguish too much. Of course, one from Afghanistan, the other from Pakistan, but they had a lot of things in common in that sense, the basic universal human values. Yeah. It's incredible, isn't it, that you, in the middle of... Uh conflict, you see both the worst and the best of human nature. You see abhorrent fighting and apocalyptic scenes, but at the same time, you see incredible gestures of humanity like you just described there. And I, I just want to zoom in on the fact that you got TB as well, because I believe you were about six at the time. And you, obviously being in a refugee camp, there's medication shortages, you know, there's uh, conditions that are unsanitary. I mean, what was that experience like for you, if you, if you can remember? Soon after arrival, most of my family and I, we suffered from malaria first, actually. Oh, wow. The um, lack of sanitation, the huge uh, number of mosquitoes, um, especially in refugee camps. And we didn't know what it was, but it was soon we started suffering from high and low temperatures, uh, vomiting, body aches, um, and the people knew locally that that's actually, these are the symptoms uh, for malaria. We would go to a local pharmacist and they would give it just medicine. There were no proper treatments for malaria, but most people would survive and some people wouldn't survive. We don't know exactly what the death uh, toll was from that. But after have, suffering from that, um, I think a few months that we were living in a refugee camp, I started develop, developing a cough, which went on for quite a while. It wouldn't settle. And it was a cough that actually, with that cough, I started losing weight. I had night sweats with it. Uh, and after about a few weeks, I started bringing up some blood with it as well. And that was a very worrying sign for my parents. Uh, we went to, he took me to, uh, my parents took me to the local doctor in the refugee camp. And when I saw that there was a huge queue waiting for that doctor, um, for, for thousands of refugees, there's just one doctor in, in a muddy room sitting there and trying to examine, trying to help people. But I still saw actually a smile on his face. Uh, I saw that he was still being very kind to people. He wasn't feeling tired. And that kind of made me very curious. Why is this person so happy uh, despite that being so, he should be tired, uh, but he was still. And then he, when he examined me, he told my dad that um, he, he had to take me to a pulmonologist, to a chest specialist because he suspected that it would be something serious. He didn't spell it out what it would be, but he said, it is. I think it's something serious and you need to go to see a lung specialist. But whilst that experience was something that actually slowly made me curious about medicine, uh, the power of medicine of how it can actually heal people and the effects that it has on the people who are practicing it. Uh, so that was kind of the first seeds. But then I was suffering so badly that my dad took me to the pulmonologist in Khaibar Bazar in Peshawar city. Uh, we went there 
Uh, and when I saw the chest specialist, again, I saw a lot of kindness in his eyes and his touch when he was examining my chest, he was listening to my chest. Yeah, he asked my dad to go to the local shop there to get my x-rays. So that's how the x-rays are done. You're seen in one room and then the next uh, room you go and then you pay for your x-ray, your x-ray is taken, you bring back the x-ray, you put it up uh, on a white screen. And that's how he examined the x-ray and he checked my weight. Then he asked me to go out to another room mm. chatting with my dad. I could just listen to what he was talking about a little bit as well. And he told my dad that uh, there's quite a high chance of uh, losing your son if we don't treat him uh, now, 60, 70%. But because the condition actually is really bad, he's lost a lot of weight. He doesn't have a lot of uh, um, body nutrition or, or nutrient in, in his body to fight actually this on his own. So he definitely needs to take the medicine and also get all the relevant nutrients for it as well. When my dad came out, I didn't know what was going on. But I saw the doctor was really kind to me and he said, like, I'll see you soon in a few weeks time. I'd like to, you to, to make sure that you take all the medicine that dad gives you, take all the milk and uh, the meat that dad is going to buy you. Uh, and I would like to ask you these questions. So that's kind of the, the start of interaction between me and that, that doctor. But when we came back to the house, everybody was crying. I had no idea why they were crying. Uh, of course, they, they hid it from me. And later on, I found out that they knew that there was 60-70% of chance of dying. And many other children died. Mm. Kilisnia survived. Uh, it's because my parents put uh, a lot of effort into treating me, giving me the medicine, taking me back and forth to the doctor, mm. giving me the nutrients that I needed. But uh, many children die. Um, they do still in villages and in, in areas where they don't have access to good health care. They don't have access to good nutrition. I'm sure you know this uh, better than I do, that how important nutrition is, uh, in when, especially when people are suffering from um, acute conditions to, mm. to enable their bodies to fight back. It's not just the medicine. We also need good nutrition for it as well. Mm. And that's what kept me going and miraculously you know, survived that. But that second interaction that I had with a doctor, which kept on and on, because I had to keep going every uh, month of, or every two months to be weighed and we had a, um, discussions about what medicine was, what he was doing, what he was, he had, uh, he was using a stethoscope to listen to my lungs. And I was asking, what's that tube? He would let me listen to him, to himself and my dad. Then one day when I went in, he gave me a stethoscope. He bought me actually from the local shop. I said, well, you can keep listening to your dad now. Uh, he also gave me an old uh, black and white book with a lot of images, pictures. He said, like, this is going to be your... Uh, medical book that's your stethoscope and your dad will get you some syringes as well that you can play with so they actually became <laughs> they actually became my toys because in the refugee camp we didn't have any toys uh, we couldn't just go out um, to to play freely um, it's it's one we didn't know many people around secondly that it's, everybody is suffering in one way or another uh, people are completely coming from a shock of conflict having lost family members, having lost everything. But they can't just build, rebuild their lives so easily. And they come in with so much mental trauma, with, with uh, so much suffering that they're just content with, with staying indoors and kind of surviving and, and in some ways reliving the trauma in their minds as well, what exactly happened. So that was uh, actually when I became inspired to become a doctor to see the healing that I saw the power of the healing of how he treated me, how he saved my life and how those doctors can actually save the lives of many other people who are suffering even more than we did. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. I, I remember in the book you, you wrote, that was the pivotal change, the seed of ambition that was planted by that, the, those doctors um, at, at such a young tender age. And, and, and it seems like you've held on to that ambition and that dream of being a doctor throughout your journey that thus, thus far, right? Absolutely. I hung on to it. Subconsciously, I was inspired, but there were so many challenges ahead. Mm. Uh, went back to Afghanistan from the refugee camp, staying for about two and a half years there. We went and my dad was above the age of military service, so he could go back. We could all go back to uh, Kabul. But within a year, the civil war broke out inside. Um, and from 92 all the way to 99, that civil war carried on. And it was really 
bloody fight street from, uh, from, from one street to another uh, amongst so many rebel groups that we didn't know who was fighting who. But mm -hmm. all it was, again, to hide in cellars from the daily rockets, the bombs. But then we had to also flee from one part of the city to another because one day one part of the city was calm. The next day it wasn't. So the, the fighting was uh, going on in that part. And so many people died. So many people lost their, their, their relatives, their friends. Um, and, and for us to be able to find safety, just, just to survive was the key important point. Um, actually, the, the, the crucial point was, was for us just to be, um, stay alive. Mm -hmm. Then we internally, we went back to Loga province, to other areas um, in Afghanistan uh, to survive. Uh, how were you moving uh, moving about throughout those different areas of, of Afghanistan? What, 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 where, where would you stay? Where would you sleep when you had to move from a, a one conflict zone to the next? Well, that's something that uh, I'm glad you mentioned. Usually in, in, during wartime, the main objective is to stay alive. Everything mm -hmm. else is secondary. Whether you find a house, whether you find a tent, whether you find a relative's house or, or you find uh, an unknown person who just welcomes you. Again, compassion, people show compassion, people show kindness in those desperate times. People will just go knock on the door like, I've come from that part of the city, can you just give me shelter? People will welcome them in their houses, not having known them at all. But they knew that the fighting was ongoing and they need support, so nobody would shut their doors on anybody. Wow. Um, and the primary objective, obviously, was to stay alive, to, to dodge the bullets or dodge the bomb. And it was how my dad would use to listen to the radio and to find out anything from the news that he was fighting who or where the, the fighting might come. So there was a lot of guessing game as well, that the fighting is getting closer here and another area is a bit uh, calmer. Uh, and they would just go out, the men would talk amongst each other, and then they would decide the next day that, okay, we have to now move from this part, go somewhere else. And we had very little with us as well. Um, very few clothes that we would carry. We knew what the bags were. We didn't have uh, huge cartons or boxes and everything for moving out the way we do here, for example. And that's it. You get your bags, you move uh, from that part, which is under fire, go somewhere else just to be able to survive. And that's exactly what's going on at the moment in uh, conflict zones. And that's why refugees flee. They flee primarily for their safety, primarily for to, to be able to live. They don't actually leave their houses, their belongings that they've worked so hard for. They don't leave just their friends, their family members to go somewhere else to have a better life. It's not the case. Um, as we discussed early on, many people are happy where they're born. Many people are happy to be surrounded by friends, family members that they've known all their lives. That's actually what um, good living is. It's not about having the everything that, or a lot of the things, materialistic things that they may not necessarily need. It's actually the meaningful stuff, the, the, the stuff that actually what makes us humans. But they leave everything behind for one reason, for safety, mm. to leave war, to flee persecution, to find safety. And that's what exactly we did internally, whether we, when we displaced in Afghanistan or later on when we uh, migrated to Pakistan. And finally, when uh, I left Afghanistan to come to the UK, again, it was to flee war uh, and, and to find safety in the first instance. And then secondly, to follow my ambition uh, or to find actually if I could achieve my dream. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad we're talking about this because I think particularly in this country, there is a rhetoric around immigration migrants that they come to the UK for a better life monetarily or we have a welfare system that they can utilize to their advantage etc cetera, etc cetera. and I think you know just by virtue of you telling your story about how you went to Pakistan and then back to Afghanistan even though you knew that there was still some um, you know sensitivities around conflict and stuff. That's where you're from. That's where you wanted to be. People don't leave those areas because of a better life in the UK. You know, there's so much more to, to life in the community and where you are and friendships. That that's what what grounds people. 
Absolutely, exactly what you've mentioned. It's actually family members, it's the community, it's the, the, the friends that you've known all your lives that actually what makes uh, living enjoyable, what living is about, that you see happiness on each other's faces and you use the little you have to make a, a good life for yourself for where you belong. Mm. But leave all that to come somewhere else to find a better life. Um, some people do, uh, so I don't disagree with that. Some people, they do. But for us to find out who's actually fleeing persecution, fleeing war, or somebody else who is fleeing not persecution or war, but they're just coming to have a better life, that requires a proper assessment, mm. a safeguard that requires systems which are robust to make sure that it doesn't infringe upon the human rights of the many people, uh, the, the thousands upon thousands of people who actually flee war. Mm. So we can't label everybody as having fled uh, to come to, to the UK or another country for a better life uh, and vice versa as well. I fully agree that there has to be a discrimination with that. But for, it, for us, in order to do that, we can't create umbrella systems mm. to ban something or to, to say that um, from now on, nobody can cross the channel because uh, it's going to uh, deter human traffickers. That sort of using an umbrella statement never works. We humans, each one of these people who are taking these very dangerous journeys to come here, they do it for a reason. And that's what we need to find. We need to find out exactly their life stories, exactly that you're talking to me, finding about my life story. Every refugee has a story. Um, and, and the only way for us to tell that is that if we have a good uh, application system, a good um, a humane system where they can be treated as humans, they can be looked after mentally, physically, and, and socially. And that's actually the basics of their, their health as well in the first place. Then we would be able to tell you know, who requires support, what sort of support they require. And amongst them, if there are some who are not really, shouldn't be here, then fair enough. They could be given protections, given safeguards, um, and, and, and all that. They could be returned back to places where they're safe but not everybody we can't label everybody yeah yeah exactly i, I want to get on to the part of your story where you come to the uk but there was one thing that you uh talked about in your nhs ted talk that i i watched i had the privilege of watching a few years ago now where you describe an incident uh where you're you're traveling uh migrating away from uh your your hometown in afghanistan and you come into contact with a russian helicopter and you and your father dive into shelter in a, in a, in a household that's been abandoned. Can, can you talk about that for a second? It was um, the journey that we took from uh, Logar province to uh, migrate to Pakistan. So that was our first migration to Pakistan at the age of five. And again, because the borders were closed, we couldn't take the usual borders. We had to take a night and day journey on donkeys and horses with uh, another 20 families as a caravan. Uh, we had guides uh, and um, with us we took some bread that was oil bread apart from that we didn't have anything else so that was our nutrition for the way and we would usually find water here and there so the journey was at night and at daytime we would find somewhere to sleep and when we were traveling for about three or four nights suddenly in, in, in the early hours of one morning uh, when it was quite light um, everybody decided that we had to hide now and they found some bushes where the children and women could uh, stay. The men went out to the local village to find somewhere we could uh, uh, actually sleep during that day so at night time we could uh, start our journey back and I went with my dad with a few men as well there. So that's when we were spotted by a spy plane. We were spotted and my dad knew that um, as soon as he heard the noise of the spy plane that within minutes the jets would arrive and the helicopter gunships would arrive. Uh, so he took me with him um, in his arm. He ran. I had no clue what was going on, but he ran really fast towards the village. He didn't return back to the bushes because I think he realized that he might endanger everybody else's life, all the children and women who were hiding in, the, in those bushes. So we went to the village. Um, he knocked on one door he, that was closed. He found another house that was abandoned. And in that house, he was searching for somewhere and, and I didn't know again what he was searching for he found an oven on the ground and he took me in that oven uh, and then he hid me there 
in the oven. And within a minute or so, the uh, helicopter gunships and the jets actually arrived. First, the jets arrived and they started the bombardment and we could actually feel the whole earth moving with every bomb that was coming down. We could actually feel the bullets and that was uh, being showered on us on the um, ceilings of the, the muddy house there. Of course, I'd, I'd close my eyes and my dad was he hugging me really tightly in that oven, um, trying to save me if anything had happened to him. And that's exactly what he told me as well, that if anything happens to me, make sure you take your family and you take them back to Kabul, Afghanistan. So you don't go back to Pakistan. You go straight to there and tell your uncle to, to look after you and make sure you look after them. And I think that was one of the moments when I realized that actually I was second in command for the family as well, even mm -hmm. at five, that if anything happened to dad, I had to take the, the leadership to, to lead my family in, in war. So miraculously, we survived that attack. Uh, and uh, after about a few minutes when the bombardment finished, then the helicopter gunships, they came in and they used artillery to fire indiscriminately all around. Um, I think they were thinking that they were the Mujahideen were there and they were using that village to attack the government forces. They wanted to destroy anything that was uh, on the ground. So those were the sort of miraculous moments that we survived. Um, many people were not that um, lucky to survive that. So along the way, we did see some human remains. Uh, I would ask my parents you know, who they belonged to, and they said, oh, these are just animal remains. But actually, you could see that the bones didn't look like the animal bones. Mm -hmm. so People died um, on those journeys, uh, sadly. Mm, yeah, I mean that that incident is just one of so many that you describe in the book of of near misses. You know, there's there's another where there was a bombing across the road from your house, and you know you've seen the children play just just before, and it just you know it just demonstrates just how arduous your journey has been and how unbelievable it is to get to your position. Now, and, and, and you know, we're telling you a story chronologically, it's really hard not to jump around because there's so many elements of it. It's just that it's just absolutely miraculous and just completely unbelievable. Um, you make it is miraculous, sorry. thank you, Rupi. It is miraculous, but I'd like to make a point here as well that people keep going through the same journeys on a daily basis now. I think that's why we see this um, the, the refugee crisis. And the world is not uh, getting any better, sadly. There are the, the increasing incidents of conflicts from Syria to Afghanistan. Um, and then you see them in, in parts of uh, Iraq, uh, as well as in Africa, in many other places. So I think that's where we really need to understand what the people who flee conflict go through. And hopefully, so my book can detail that journey. But so it's not, although it's, it's my story, but I have, I hope that people can see the journey of millions of other refugees through what I'm describing in that book. Absolutely, absolutely. L let's get to, to the part in, in the book now where you make the decision to come to the UK. What, what spurred that decision on and, and how, how did you get about doing that? Because it just seems so far removed to even be able to have the opportunity to, to, to come here. Before making that decision, we, um, during the internal war, um, when we went back to Kabul, Afghanistan, the uh, civil war that started, we migrated again to Pakistan, the refugee camp, because the war was uh, so bad. And back in the refugee camp, because I was old enough at that time to um, look for education, to look for some sort that I could do something with my life. I know subconsciously I wanted to become a doctor, but I had no clue where to go about it. The schools in Afghanistan were shut. Usually we would, when, whenever we had a chance to come in, we would talk with each other to find out who'd lost family members, who'd lost friends. And the teacher would be telling us stories about conflict. It was not about math, science, or um, any of that. So most of my education did happen during conflict. It was in cellars. Whatever books I could find on the streets, I would just grab them or my dad would grab them for me and uh, I would just start reading them at nighttime. Um, whether it, when the bombing was not there, we would go upstairs into a room and when the bombing was there, we would go into the um, a cellar with a lamp to read whatever I could under a desk. That was when I became so inspired to find ways so I can educate myself, opportunities. And I was absolutely thirsty for those opportunities. When we back to, when we went to Pakistan to uh, refugee camp again, I looked for those opportunities where I could study 
uh, and there was um, a, a center, an institute, they call it uh, um, Islamic University. It wasn't actually a proper university. So it was an institute where you could go and get educated. So I started uh, um, reading, preparing for that. It had an entrance exam. Uh, I went to a local school and I told them that, yes, I've done my schooling in Kabul, Afghanistan. I just wanted to bypass the whole thing. And uh, they uh, asked me, okay, the exam is in two months' time. I had to prepare for the school um, matriculation exam. Uh, actually, they passed almost everybody because they just wanted to sell the certificate. So they gave me a certificate as well. I went into this institute. Uh, it's, uh, it was supposed to be a medical school, but it wasn't a medical school, but it was uh, mainly teaching us right from the start of uh, how a cell works, and the, the basics of biology, the basics of um, chemistry, maths, and so on. And that's actually one and a half year that I remember that I had good education over there, and which was the equivalent of GCC, but the rest of my education was all over the place. Uh, so I, I learned a lot of things the wrong way and um, many things uh, the right way. Uh, but and during that uh, one, one and a half year, when I got the foundation of the science, um, I equipped myself with that, but then I had to give it up. I had to give it up because I didn't find a reason for me to continue for another five years uh, learning at this Islamic university. The certificate was not useful anywhere. It was not even acceptable in Pakistan to practice as a doctor. So it was only acceptable in the refugee camp. Even it was not acceptable back in war in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. I had to abandon that and kind of my hopes got smashed completely to pieces and not being able to find a way to study medicine. I went back to Kabul. Uh, the Taliban were in power at that time. Uh, and I was helping my dad uh, drive his taxi as well from time to time. I had no license, but there was hardly anybody on the streets. And it was the Taliban that we had to take from one part of the city to another, and they would be paying us. And back there, I realized that there was a threat to my life uh, soon that I was recruited to fight um, on the front line and not being able to achieve my dream to become a doctor because the universities were shut. There was hardly any education. So the combination of trying to survive one and then being able to find somewhere that I can educate myself was the motivation for me to flee Afghanistan. But we didn't know how to do it. There was no way, there was no easy way to do it. You can't just go to an embassy. And that's exactly the point um, I really would like to emphasize here as well. There are no legal routes for refugees to flee conflict zone. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm talk talking about my story here, but the case is still present. I talk to my family members in Afghanistan. I talk to people uh, in conflict zones through our charity, International Telemedicine Charity, that we do. There are no proper resettlement routes available. Now, we, they're talking about the re resettling, uh, for example, the interpreters who would work with um, the British Army, who would work with the American forces. But such systems were not available uh, at, those, at that time. And how about the millions of other people or the thousands of other people who need to survive. There are no legal routes for them. We didn't have any route. So we had to find, ask local people how they managed to flee the country. Uh, and one of the people who I was studying with uh, in Shamshitu camp, in the refugee camp in Pakistan, I'd heard about him. He was, his name uh, was Hakim, that he'd fled to, to the UK. I spoke with him on the phone and he told me, yes, uh, life is um, in the UK. They're very hospitable. Um, they're very compassionate and they allow me to work and they um and i asked him can you study he said yeah i can study i'm not studying but yes you can study so for me that was at the back of my mind two things one it's it's safe that i can flee conflict secondly there was an opportunity for me to study uh, so that was um, something i i really aspired to do to flee the country uh, but then we had to find ways to do it and i had to find uh, people um, which later on turned out to be human smugglers, to, which asked for a lot of money. Initially, they sold the concept to us saying that you will be, we're going to get you a refugee status visa all the way from one of the countries, which would be UK, Germany, or America. Um, but it will cost you a lot of money and it will cost you some time as well because they will assess you and all that. So and that brings me to another point that refugees don't really necessarily understand the, the parts they take the routes they take, they're so desperate to, to flee conflict that they would take any route. Yet it's the, the alternative of dying. Mm -hmm. So if that, any other route goes, hence a lot of people, they take these really dangerous journeys, whether through sea, through air, 
to flee conflict and to find safety. And that's what happened with me that we paid a lot of money um, thinking that the visa that was given to me was actually a refugee status from the UK. It later on, it turned out not to be a refugee status. It was a fake password that was um, uh, given to me by the human smuggler. And he was, it was a human smuggler. And, uh, but it got me to the UK here. And that's uh, back in the UK, I found that out that uh, how much of a risk I had taken by my parents selling the house to selling everything they had to get that visa for me in order for me to flee the country for my safety and then to be able to pursue my dreams here yeah yeah i, th I think any family listening to this would do exactly the same thing and to give some context you know the reason why initially your family fled afghanistan was because your father was of conscription age and you only returned until he was past that age and you were coming up to the same issue that red flag of, of you know, you being conscripted to work, uh, to, to uh, be part of the military. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's incredible that, you know, your, your family made such sacrifices to do that. But like I said, it's something that everyone would want to do and aspire to do if they had the chance to do so. And when you got into the UK, what, what was your experience? Because I, I, I imagine pretty much immediately they recognized that you had a fake passport. It was. It, it's a long story there. Um, it's uh, when when the, I arrived back here, they I was um, handcuffed. I was taken by the police, and there was an incident on the plane where um, I was travelling with two other um, refugees from Afghanistan. We were given instructions to destroy our passports upon landing here, but two other refugees they went and tried to burn their passports in their toilet uh, on the lavatory um, on the plane. When I tried to do the same thing, there was already smoke from the other people. And then they realized that uh, uh, they might be burning the whole plane down or something like that. So they called for a police force to arrive. When we arrived in Heathrow, we were welcomed by uh, so many police uh, cars. We were handcuffed, we were taken to a cell um, and interrogated. But the interrogation mainly actually went on for uh, um, couple of things that was uh, for having uh, the fake passport that was the main one there but, yeah. uh, although I was telling them you know I've fled Afghanistan you know I've been given a refugee status you you should actually check your records that's exactly what the people told us they said no this is actually a fake passport that was given to you and we are charging you for it and I don't know mm -hmm. what charge means uh, at that time uh, but then you know whenever I we talk about Adversity, we talk about human compassion as well. I was very lucky to find Hakim again, my friend Hakim. He found, I found his number. I called him from uh, uh, Feltham, which I was locked up in Feltham there. Um, and uh, I told him that this is where I am. Uh, he was absolutely bemused. Uh, and he said, what on earth are you doing there? Uh, I told him the story, what had happened. He came uh, and then he found me a uh, solicitor. He found me a solicitor, which later on sent a barrister to fight my corner in the court. And he did an amazing job. And I'm still in touch with that barrister still. <laughs> yeah. he, he actually was the one who took me to Cambridge University years later uh, to, <laughs> because I didn't have a family to take me out, to uh, take my equipments and everything that I had with me to move me back there. Again, my point here is that the kindness that was shown by Hakim, my friend, then by the barrister to fight for on, for on my corner. Then he gave me his card as well. He told me he knew I was so vulnerable. I was 15 years old. I was absolutely over the moon because I was safe. You know, I didn't mm. care about anything else. I was just safe here. But he knew that I had a lot of other challenges to go through. He gave me the card and he asked me to contact him whenever I wanted to, uh, if I needed help. Uh, and then when I continued to, um, my aspiration or my kind of, my search for education. I went on to work during the day and at night time I started studying. And finally, when I got my um, AS level results, A grades uh, at my AS level results, I called the barrister and I told him the good news. He couldn't believe me that. Because uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you, you hardly spoke English at that point, right? I'm assuming your education in English would have been from the TV or VHS videos at the time, because this is pre 2001. So this is, you know, pre all the checks on the planes and, and all the rest of it, and, and quite early in the technology uh, uh, standpoint as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I had to, my grammatical English was, wasn't bad uh, because I'd learned from books. So I knew kind of my grammar, but my spoken English was not good. Um, so I, I had, um, it was really, really patchy. Um, and I had to quickly learn my English. I was practicing my English when I was working in shops on Edgeware Road with customers. And I was also working uh, as a um, kitchen porter as well. So I would use any opportunity to practice my English, but behind um, all of that, my aim was to get to university. Uh, and I'd soon found out about ways to get into university. First, I asked the local refugees how I could actually become a doctor. Um, within a few weeks, uh, well, first of all, what I did was that I was so desperate to find a job because my family was still suffering back in Afghanistan. It, we had a huge family. The Taliban was still in control. So I had to find means to pay for their expenses as well, as well as for the large amount of money that I took um, for me to, to come here to the UK. So within a week, I went to find a job on, on Edgeware Road. Um, again, you know, I saw kindness in, this, in the eyes of this Irish man who gave me a job within me having any sort of uh, documents or anything else, he took mercy on me. And, and it was my persistence as well, even though he was pushing like, he wasn't sure I was too young, you know, I'll be able to work. But I sold it to him that I could actually sell his perfumes, his, uh, the cars that he had. I told him that I could speak uh, Urdu, Hindi and Arabic languages. Uh, so he, he was uh, taken by that and then he gave me the job. So I started working within a week in that, and then I started working as a kitchen porter and did some cleaning jobs around as well. So that was how I used daytime, um, seven days a week, uh, to literally be able to pay for my, my expenses as well as for the expenses back in Afghanistan. But I soon turned my attention to education. I asked the local refugees who I found out uh, from one another through Hakim, and I asked them how I could educate myself. And they actually all advised me against it. Most of them, they advised me against and they said, well, we know, we all know where we're coming from. We hardly been educated. So they didn't mean any harm. But what mm -hmm. they would tell me is that for me to be smart about using my time, because in Afghanistan, so many families depended on us. So they said, why don't you just keep working hard to make sure that you are able to support yourself, your family members. Uh, you can uh, work in a chicken shop and you can start to become a taxi driver. And then one day you will become uh, the owner of a chicken shop. So for them, that was kind of the cycle that they were used to. That was uh, the vision that they had coming here. And of course, these are all hardworking jobs and I really admire them very, very hardly. But you know, to become a chicken wing specialist was not something uh, that was my vision. For me, it was more to become uh, a doctor, to heal, to heal my family, to heal the people who I had seen uh, so much suffering amongst them. Yeah, yeah. I mean, reading your story when you, when you got to, how old were you when you when you arrived? Fifteen. Fifteen. Okay, so you're you're uh, mid teens. You come here. You move into Portobello Road, I believe it is, um, with some other refugees, uh, all sleeping ar around. You know, in a, in a place that's far too small for you guys. And you're working at Edgewell Road. You're working a number of different jobs to make ends meet and to send money back um, home as well to support yourself. And on top of that, you decide to do your AS levels and A levels to chase your dream of, of being a doctor. W which university did you go to, uh, college did you go to during that time? So um, first 1999 until uh, 2001, uh, sorry, 2000, I was um, purely working and I was trying to polish my English first, to read up on my English. Uh, and I also did GCSEs actually on my own. Uh, on way to to work on the buses, uh, on on return journey from buses late at night, uh, and I love those journeys, the London buses. When I see look at them now, still I remember, I, I used to like sitting right at the front. That would give me a sense of freedom that I'm finally free from conflict. I'm finally free, I can actually breathe. Um, that would make me so happy. Those small instances, but that's when I we used to study as well, uh, my uh, English as well as for GCSE subjects. Then 2000 onwards, I started going to college. That was my level college. I started doing only two AS levels. I just wanted to test the water, whether, whether I could actually do the AS or I couldn't do it. Uh, and I found out that by the end of the um, uh, year, that I got um, A grades at uh, AS levels at, at those two. 
then I was encouraged to do more. So the next year I took four more AS levels because I had to compete with so many of the people coming with major backgrounds, uh, whether it's private or not private schools, but at least they had a number of GCSEs and amazing marks in them as well. Uh, and the way it was working was backwards from... Uh, so yes, yeah, so I was um, studying uh, during the day in three colleges because I couldn't afford to study in one college for more than 16 hours. That would cut off my housing benefit which I couldn't afford to pay, pay to put, put a better rent at that time, a uh, huge rent. And I had to save money for my staff and pay um, uh, for expenses back at home as well. So the three colleges were Maidaville, Westminster, Kingsway and Kings Cross and the Hammersmith College and <laughs> between various subjects uh, and, and uh, tried to make a, a way out of it. Yeah. And you, you had um, this instance where you were applying for medical schools and you, you got some advice from... Um, uh, a college tutor about which medical schools you wanted to apply to and you mentioned Cambridge um, what what was their reaction w w when you said that well I first of all actually about Cambridge um, applying to Cambridge was not my idea um, I was working for British Gas as a salesman at that time there was another job later on that I found <laughs> yeah. but through that um, I came across a graduate student from Cambridge University um, when I saw him, he, he asked me what grades I had at AS level. I told him I got all A's and he encouraged me to apply to Cambridge. Then he took me on a tour to Cambridge. So I was absolutely blown away. I was so inspired. Um, and uh, I went on, um, there were some uh, open days as well. And the Trinity Hall College, the admissions tutor, Professor Bradley, he was very welcoming. So that really inspired me to apply. Then I came back to the, my college, uh, which was in Westminster Kingsway. Uh, and I told my, I told them that I wanted to apply to Cambridge, and so they kind of, the huge bemusement on their face, and they said, "Well, you know, are you sure you want to do this? Because you're going to burn one of your UCAS places. Uh, you're only allowed to apply to four medical colleges, so you, you're going to burn." So that was not very encouraging. And then when I insisted that I wanted to do that um, to apply, uh, and I needed some help with uh, my application as well as with my interview. Then they referred me to somebody who was locally known as, as one of the tutors who would prepare students for interviews. Uh, again, when I went into that preparation room with him, he focused mainly on all the things I didn't have to apply to Cambridge. For example, not having GCSEs, uh, not being white, not uh, coming, going, um, coming from, uh, from uh, a private school, um, and, and everything he could find negative, he just put it in front of me. He said, These, this is exactly what's wrong and, and why we don't want you to burn one of your places. I think he didn't mean harm there, but he was just so pessimistic about everything there that actually I just wanted to get out of that room. I came out of that room. I burst out crying and I was really heartbroken that nobody was trying to take me seriously in that sense. But I gathered my thoughts and actually that's how I use my self CBT as well the, a coping technique that I'd used all my life trying to hang on to small bits of successes and for me I just told myself that hang on I've actually survived the bombs in Afghanistan I've made it on my own to this country my family is still alive I'm so thankful for all these things I'm so thankful to be able to to breathe to be able to have a roof over my head to be able to to eat which I didn't have these opportunities to have good nutrition so what is it? You know, I lose one place, so be it. Um, I don't care about that. So if the uh, Soviet helicopter gunships uh, didn't take me down, uh, I don't care about not applying to Cambridge. And that's sort of the attitude uh, I had built uh, at those times that kept pushing me towards uh, actually getting my uh, good grades at AS and A levels as well, because I was competing with people whose English was absolutely amazing. The writing, everything was really top notch. So I had to put actually double hard work um, it wasn't that kind of like I came in with uh, so much educational background that I could rely on. So I really worked double. I, I, I bought the, the past papers for so many years. Uh, and, and instead of one or two years, as somebody told me that if you work through past papers for one or two years, you will succeed. I actually bought five years worth of past papers because I didn't want to take any chances. So whatever I didn't have actually for my background, I actually made up for it through my sheer dedication to my sheer hard work. And I remember coming to the UK with $100 in my pocket, but that sheer determination, that uh, steel-like uh, 
uh, will to be able to succeed continued with me and that kept pushing me as well. But it was quite complex, the situation for me. On the other hand was that I started having this, these nightmares. I started having these flashbacks as well, which was something I did not know what it was. And that was, again, I was using the, the tests, my tested the mechanisms uh, and the coping techniques that I built, for example, doing exercise um, to, to cope with my loneliness, um, using self CBT, uh, and also the gratitude that I was using plenty of that as well. And my faith to, to never give up on hope. There's always hope. Um, and for that, for me to be able to serve my family was one of the greatest honors. And that kept giving me that more reward internally as well. But those sort of incidences kept coming that whenever I was standing near a tube, the sound of the tube coming, passing near me, would just make me jump. And I didn't know what it was. Or for example, when I was walking on the street in London, I would just suddenly see a tank coming towards me and trying to fire at me. That sort of flashback and those nightmares, they kept coming Sometimes they go, would go away, but whenever I spoke with my family, they would come back. And later on, I realized that they were actually symptoms uh, and signs of the post-traumatic stress disorder that many people living through conflict zone, they suffer from it. There's a very high proportion of people, they, when they leave conflict, they come with uh, that mental trauma with them. But despite all that, I managed to get my A-levels and I went to apply to Cambridge University as well. And I succeeded in uh, getting into Cambridge. Yeah, that's incredible. I mean, you talk about having this vision for your reality, these four walls, education, uh, an idea of where you were heading. And that's essentially what you manifested when you went to Cambridge. And I remember you describing the four walls of your of your accommodation and the lawn outside and being this uh, incredible institution. I, I imagine the culture shock of first going from Afghanistan to uh, London and now London to Cambridge must have been uh, huge and then also you had the PTSD flashbacks to 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 come deal with as well when you were at Cambridge uh, how, how was that so at Cambridge actually uh, the uh, social isolation came a lot more to the forefront because I was running on adrenaline for such a long time that I didn't have time to reflect on what had happened in a way that I had boxed my old life like, the years that I'd left um, behind me in, in conflict zone in a box. And I, and I thought that for me, starting a new life is just like that. It's so easy. Uh, but I realized soon in Cambridge that I was actually at, a, at extreme disadvantage. One, socially, I didn't have anybody. There would be families who would come in uh, every month or so. They would bring in food. Uh, they would see the, uh, the young kids growing up and adjusting to the university system. I didn't have anybody with me. Secondly, I would uh, struggle actually financially as well because I was still trying to pay for um, my own expenses. My youngest brother, who came, my younger brother, who came in as well, I was looking after him. But also, I was paying for family expenses as well there, and I had to hide all that from the, the tutors because we were not allowed to work. But also, what happened was that it was a shock for me as well, not having a good educational background backfired here. I didn't know how to actually study. For A-levels, for me, it was a bit easier. Not easier, but only easier in comparison to Cambridge because I relied on past papers. Relying on, I relied on putting everything into my memory, but at Cambridge, it didn't work. So I struggled the first uh, year uh, and the first couple of years, I struggled and I had to figure out how to learn. I had to figure out how to compete with all the students who are coming in top of their classes from so many amazing places that they would be just absolutely fluent in everything. I want, and I wasn't fluent. Uh, but again, I didn't give up. And I knew that I was at a disadvantage. I was struggling socially, financially, and mentally as well. And I think that affected me even more at that time, that I realized that I was actually a proper outsider. Uh, although I was now safe, the conflict wasn't there. I had all these amazing things that I never had. But I was very lonely. Uh, and mentally... I wasn't in a great place, but I kept going. I, and I still kept using the same coping mechanisms, which was my faith, having being able to look at the positives, to, to have gratitude for the smaller things at night and early morning. Exercise was a huge thing for me. And slowly I paid attention to my nutrition as well, because at that time it, it was all over, over the place. I was young, but I slowly found out more about nutrition, how nutrition actually worked. Not in a lot of detail, but even on a macro level, 
you know, I need to have my vegetables, I need to have my fruits, rather than uh, spending uh, hours and hours on Red Bull uh, trying to, which was actually the case. It was, I was on, running on pure adrenaline, uh, completely on, on uh, sleepless nights when I was doing my A-levels, but at, at university I had to readjust things and I had to look at things a lot more in that sense. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And so throughout Cambridge, you, you were there for your preclinical years and then you made a decision to come to Imperial. Um, we would have crossed paths at this point. So I, I was at Imperial from 2003 to 2009. And uh, I do remember you, but I don't think we would have had more than a, a couple of sentences conversation. And, and I don't know whether that was because you were still isolated or a different uh, social groups, but either way, we, we wouldn't come to have another conversation until you did your incredible NHS TED talk uh, a number of years later. But what was it like coming back to Imperial and, and, and London? And also, you know, you, you've casually mentioned taking care of your uh, 12 year old brother who went to Wilsdon uh, and was doing his a -le AS levels eventually. But you, you know, what, what was, what was all that like? Well, first of all, I think we're, we're, we're really lucky to have been to um, Imperial college in London. It's an amazing, university it's world class i still can't believe it that uh, i've managed to go to cambridge uh, imperial college and then later on have a short stint at harvard as well i think the one thing i would like to mention is that it's the integration that it takes a while for refugees to integrate as well uh, at universities i alluded to early on that i was struggling on many levels there and that's why i wasn't able to find really friendship groups i wasn't able to because I didn't have the support mechanisms around me, the social, the mental support mechanisms. So for me, it was quite a bit, and my life experiences was so different from everybody else that I couldn't talk yeah. to the, the usual chats that you do around movies or around the dramas that you see on telly. They were completely beyond me. I, I'd never been on holidays, so I didn't know what experiences of holidays were to, to share with my fellow groups as well. But having said that, I had an amazing time at Imperial College. Uh, and that's where most, uh, a lot of the clinical stuff happened there. Uh, at Cambridge University, it was a preclinical, a lot of the theoretical knowledge that we gained for medicine. And back at Imperial College, it was more clinical that we were sent on wards to see the patients. And that's when I started realizing that my, I started actually seeing that my dream of becoming a doctor was becoming a reality, that finally I was able to interact with patients, I was on the walls, I was in hospital up and down. Uh, I was absolutely ecstatic about the whole uh, experience, going up, down, staying too late from one ward to another, one patient to another, to trying to actually feel that it was a reality that, that, that I'd made it. Of course, I still had um, you know, issues socially. I was coming to a point later on during the Imperial College that I didn't know where I belonged, actually. I was one way becoming so British, but on the other hand, I had so many values from Afghanistan that I was in between. Um, until quite later on that I had to embrace the fact that I was both. Uh, and, and obviously I'm, I'm a proud Afghan British now, but at that time I couldn't reconcile the two facts together. That loss of identity at that point was a huge blow towards the end of my medical school training. And that kind of hampered me for a year as well towards the end there. But overall, I had an amazing time at Imperial College in London. I still go and um, from time to time when I go to Kensington, I pass by and I look at the library and look at the amazing uh, rooms, the canteen uh, and, and all the places that I've visited. Yeah, that's incredible. It's an amazing campus. And uh, you're right, it's this incredible opportunity to, to, to study at a world-class institution. Uh, our, our experience of medical school, just hearing your journey, was just so vastly different. And I can understand why you might have had some issues, particularly in your first year at Cambridge, of integrating into that medical sort of fraternity, sorority, whatever we call it these days. Um, and you ended up going to uh, Basildon, um, which also <laughs> was the university, uh, which is the uh, district general hospital that I ended up working at as well. And oh, my did F1. you? Yeah, yeah. So I remember those long corridors and those nights as well and like 
the incredible staff there as well, like uh, Dr. Rehman, who was the um, endocrinologist there. Um, we got on really well. And I remember the radiologist who, who you know, you've obviously worked with um, an incredible amount since then. Uh, I forget his name now. You mentioned him in the book. Um, Dr. Sameh Khan. That's it. Yes, Dr. Sameh Khan. I remember as an F1, uh, having to go and speak to him about a CT request, and I had no idea what I was doing. And he was the nicest man, the nicest man, because... For the listeners uh, who don't understand the context, you know, when you go and speak to the consultant radiologist, it's a, it's a bit of a grilling. You know, you, you, it's a precious resource that we have in terms of radiology and the use of um, uh, imagery. And so you have to present your case, uh, almost like selling it to them. And I had no idea what I was talking about. I had no idea why I was there. So, yeah, no, he's a lovely, lovely guy. He is. He's uh, actually he's one of the trustees for our charity. Uh, for the uh, Telehill International Telemedicine Charity, and I keep in touch with him on a daily basis. He reports our scans now internationally coming from Afghanistan, from Syria, from Africa, and he advises actually on education as well. Uh, so he is absolutely an amazing guy. Uh, and that's actually when I got inspired to become a radiologist. Uh, so first, when I was at Basel, then when I started my foundation year one training, um, I met up. Like yourself, I had to go and ask him questions uh, to get approval for one of the scans. Um, but prior to meeting uh, Dr. Sami Khan, I met uh, Dr. Kaiser Malik, uh, who is another good friend. Uh, he's a radiologist. He introduced me to Dr. Sami Khan, and he told me that Dr. Sami Khan, he really likes the teaching. Uh, so I went to one of his teaching, and he asked me questions what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I had set my eyes on cardiology. Uh, or general surgery, so I was just torn between the two. And then he convinced me that I should do radiology. And I saw that radiology was central and pivotal to so many things in hospital setting. And uh, so by the end of my foundation year one training, I decided that I wanted to do, and I did some uh, audits with him as well. Uh, he allowed me to, to uh, write some papers. Uh, so I wrote some uh, poster presentations as well, which I gave in Liverpool and some other conferences to build up my CV towards uh, going for my interviews in radiology training. Then I came back to um, in London to, to complete my foundation year two training in London. And after that, I went back to Basel then because I took a couple of years um, before I got into radiology training. And I used that time to do a bit of uh, the equivalent of course surgical training as a trust grade doctor, so I acquired a bit more skills in that department. And then I'm 2014. I started uh, radiology training uh, up north where I am now. Yeah, yeah. No, it's in, an incredible journey. And I, and I guess, um, actually, before we talk about um, your, your telehealth charity and, and the ideas that, that, that sparked that, um, you mentioned uh, about integration and how uh, you struggled with identity. Were you Afghani? Were you British? Were you both? Um, and, and I guess that came to a, a hilt when your, your family, and, and as is the case in a lot of um, uh, cultures from that region, were sort of asking you questions about marriage and settling down. Um, how, how, did you, how did you deal with that? And, and obviously, you know, uh, married and you've got kids now and, uh, and very, very settled. Um, but, but what was that journey like for you? I think those experiences are, can be pretty personal as well. Um, I don't think I can generalize in that sense because people's experiences coming at what age they leave the country, what age they settle, uh, the people they meet. Some people might come across people that they've left uh, um, similar country. They're coming from a similar background. They might, might find it easier to talk about their backgrounds. They have, may have a lot in common with. Um, but in my particular case, that wasn't the case. I hadn't met you know, many Afghanis in London. I had met a few sporadically, but not people who are potentially that I could get, uh, look at as, as uh, life partners. Uh, and my idea was that, you know, one day I'll go back to Afghanistan, I'll get married there. And it would have been easier in that sense that, because the way I was looking at it is that I wasn't sure whether I would spend in my entire life back in the UK or not. That was another issue for me. So I, I wasn't certain what was happening, but I also had the blessing of my family who told me that whatever made me happy, that I should stick with that, regardless of where um, that person is coming from. It's about love, it's about kindness, it's about love, um, life partnership for life. 
that I should be able to find that person. And I was lucky later on to find my wife, uh, Davina, to meet her. But prior to that, I had a lot of conflicting thoughts in my head as well. Um, and for, the, for the reasons I mentioned and kept going back and forth to Afghanistan to figure out if I had actually future back in Afghanistan or back here, it wouldn't have been fair on if I got married back in the UK and then I, deciding that, oh, I have to go back to Afghanistan. Um, sadly, when I went to Afghanistan on several occasions, I realized soon that uh, my future was back in the UK. I had worked so hard and I knew that from the UK, I could actually help better um, in, in Afghanistan, rather than me coming to Afghanistan and, and staying there. Although the Afghanistan reconstruction had started, the rebuilding had started, but there was a sense amongst everybody knew, knowing the political system, knowing uh, the, the, the building of Afghanistan wouldn't be that easy. Uh, and sadly, that's the case now that the war has intensified. There's a lot of war ongoing at the moment. Um, but coming to my own personal life, I made a decision that I wanted to stay back in the UK. Uh, and that's when I started uh, looking for a potential wife as well um, and got on a dating scene and finally met uh, my wife, Davina, uh, in uh, 2011. And we're happily married. We've got two children now. Yeah, I was, I'll save that romantic story for the book because it's, uh, it's very well told as well uh, about how initially you, you were thought of as a, a, a geezer from uh, Essex. <laughs> I was, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, we met in Barclay um, Hotel where Davina was working as a supervisor there. I'd actually met um, there with my friend Mark, who um, we were going to ca have a catch up. And I met Davina and I was uh, blown away by Davina. I wanted to make a conversation with her. Uh, so I managed to find uh, her phone number. Uh, and then when I uh, texted her for a coffee, then she discussed the possibility of meeting me for a coffee with her friends. And when I told her that, oh, I'm living in Basildon, you know, I'm a doctor in Basildon, that's when everybody thought that, oh, I was a, a geezer from Basildon, maybe a gangster there or somebody, <laughs> somebody else. Obviously, not everybody in Basildon is a gangster. No, no, of course not. It's a lovely place, uh, <laughs> but uh, for some reason, it has a bit of a reputation. Yeah, totally. Um, so you, you mentioned there about how you, you came to the realization you'd be able to help Afghanistan in a much bigger capacity from the UK and from your position here. W when did you come across the idea for the telehealth organization that you now uh, uh, run? Um, and, uh, and, and what were the foundations for that? So the idea first for me, when, as soon as I became a doctor in uh, 2010, I started uh, looking back into my initial vision that one day I would become a doctor and I'll start healing people. And that obviously at, in the NHS, we heal people, we help people. But for me that I'd seen so much suffering around my own family, my own life, but also so many other people, that was my vision to be able to give back in some way that I, I kept, could. I kept going back and forth to Afghanistan every few months during my leave. Uh, and I went to hospitals. I asked them how I could help to university as well but I soon realized that actually on my own I wouldn't be able to help too much uh, and for me to make that huge difference that I wanted to make it wouldn't be through my personal experiences alone and I also realized that there were so many other people in the NHS that they wanted to help I would tell them stories about conflict about Afghanistan that how people they need support and they said how can I help but there was no way for them to take a leave uh, it wasn't safe for them to go to Afghanistan and financially you wouldn't have been, they wouldn't have been able to do that as well so readily. So that made me think of finding a way to be able to connect the healthcare professionals living in the UK and uh, first in the UK, now we've got volunteers from across the globe, how people from the NHS could be able to help people back in Afghanistan, medical colleagues in Afghanistan. It took about four years, uh, initially, uh, that from, from me trying to help and then trying to recruit people to come with me, that didn't succeed. And finally, I came across uh, the idea of telemedicine. Um, MSF was doing it at the time. It's not something I invented, but MSF was doing it in the capacity and the store forward that they were sending cases, not in a life, too much life emergency, but more in a store forward sense, that uh, in a non-emergency uh, scenario. 
And I also saw that in Afghanistan, in the villages, back in hospitals, everybody was using smartphones. They had really um, good smartphones with good cameras, uh, and they were using social media as well. And that was the light bulb moment for me to find out how we could actually tap into mobile phones and social media to be able to connect healthcare professionals from the NHS to healthcare professionals on the ground in Afghanistan. Uh, and I didn't know how, I didn't know if it would be possible, but as soon as I looked into that idea, I actually started pursuing it more. And I discussed back with the medical professionals back there. I started collecting their phone numbers. Uh, I even told them that I've got a huge pool of volunteers sitting back in the UK who wants to help. And that wasn't the case, but I was visualizing in my mind that that would be the case. Uh, and uh, convinced that side, then I convinced the hospital, the chiefs of the hospital to allow us to do something like that. And I came back to the UK. When I came back to the UK, I, it wasn't too difficult for me to sell the concept because there was, people are compassionate, people are giving inherently. Almost everybody has that ability in them to give, to be kind. And for me, it, it was just telling those stories of what's happening on the ground, the resources the medical colleagues struggle with, the lack of expertise on the ground, and for them not being able to go to conferences to upgrade their education of how much valuable all this could be if they're connected. But then the politics come into, into this as well. Dealing with Afghanistan politics is, is absolutely, can be a nightmare. So I convince people in the government to allow me to connect because there's a lot of uh, governance issues involved here. There's data transfer, there's clinical governance, there's political issues. And we had to take that permission from the Ministry of Public Health. But luckily, the government agreed to that. Um, and uh, they allowed us to pilot with five hospitals in Kabul, Afghanistan first. And that pilot survey that we did around that showed that many lives were saved. And the doctors had a lot of good things to say about the education, about their education that was enhanced through this um, partnership. That they allowed us to roll the entire um, teleheal system to throughout Afghanistan. And we signed an MAU memorandum of understanding with the Ministry of Public Health that they let us get connected to 14 emergency departments and IC departments throughout the country. So in summary, um, Arian Teleheal, which is the name of the international telemedicine charity that I lead, was founded in 2015. Uh, now we have more than 150 volunteers coming from uh, various specialties, but mainly we support emergency departments uh, as well as the mental health front in Afghanistan, in Syria, in parts of Africa. But we also now enable other international organizations. So one, it's our own volunteers from the NHS, from the US, Canada, and Australia, who dedicate, who allow their time very kindly to be used by medical colleagues on the ground. And they use a system called what we call reverse innovation as well. So through that, a lot of learning that happens, a lot of the experiences that happen on the ground are absorbed by our colleagues here. And we, on our system, we do have the registrars as well who keep learning from those experiences. So we help the, the NHS, uh, our colleagues who never been, who would never be able to, to see a very extreme case of tuberculosis, for example. They would never be able to see a bomb blast uh, on a regular basis that happens in Afghanistan or the trauma as a result of that, they see it on their smartphones and they allow that to happen in their free time, whether it's at home, whether it's sitting on a sofa, whether they're having a coffee in a hospital, they just look at their phones on their so secure social media and that's how they're connected to, to their colleagues. They're thousands of miles away, they say hello to each other, they learn from each other, they save lives, but also it, it promotes dialogue it promotes peace amongst them. And that's, I think, dialogue misunderstanding um, to, to remove that misunderstanding of dialogue is a key to peace. And that's actually the long-term vision for our charity is to be able to keep enhancing that dialogue across the globe in a very neutral format, in a very compassionate, in a very giving format, that's uh, medicine. Yeah. I mentioned that our charity also enables other organizations to operate similarly. So we're kind of giving our blueprint to organizations and governments, and that includes to World Health Organization, for which I will also serve as a digital health expert. Um, and we have given it to MSF. Um, we've also given it to Health Education England to support some of the fellows who travel to Africa 
South Africa uh, or other parts of India on, on six monthly rotation. Now we've got an amazing partnership uh, that's going on with the British Association of Physicians of Indian origin. So within the space of one month uh, in response to the COVID pandemic, they managed to recruit more than 650 volunteers um, from across all the specialties. And as we speak now, the cases are ongoing on the phone, I can see them. So they, these volunteers are connected using a very similar format to the Teleheal. So we're one of the partners, so we've given in the blueprint, but they're now using it. And they're giving uh, advice to juniors, doctors or colleagues back in, in these hospitals in India. And, and at the same time, they're learning from them as well, you know, to see exactly how they're dealing with these um, devastating effects of COVID in, in, in various parts of the India. So they show solidarity, uh, they exchange knowledge with each other, they exchange experiences with each other. And this is something so rewarding that I see it on my phone that Teleheal has now expanded to such an extent that now what we save lives, our volunteers save lives themselves, but then we allow other organizations to do it as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I know you're a very humble person um, and, and the, the way I keep on describing your, your story is incredible, but you know, to coordinate uh, the inception of a charity during your radiology training as well, I mean, that, that must have been quite a feat. And just for the listeners, because um, a lot of the listeners aren't, aren't, aren't medics, can you give an example of how uh, Arian Teleheal will coordinate a dialogue between a physician in the UK or somewhere, uh, or somewhere else with uh, a physician in an ICU or an accident and emergency uh, doctor in, in Kabul or, or another of Afghanistan? So for example, um, a case could come from an emergency department in Afghanistan. Um, this case could be um, a road traffic accident that somebody has been struck by a car. They come to the emergency department. Then the doctor who's dealing with that case goes through procedures to stabilize that patient. First of all, make sure that he has uh, survived that the immediate impact of the trauma by lying him down, by making sure that the neck is uh, secure, and they take some x-rays. Those x-rays images or the CT scan is available. Um, those images and x-rays are all sent to us on smartphones. They use WhatsApp. So they use WhatsApp, they take pictures of those images, the CT x-ray scan, the lab results, they summarize the case, the history of it, and what they find on the, uh, by examining the patient, they send it all to us to one of the coordinators in Afghanistan, it's myself still. And that coordinator then looks at the case as a whole to see what specialists are required for this case. For example, radiologist is required to report the X-ray or CT scan. Then you need an orthopedic surgeon to comment on what's happening with the, if there is a fracture. Uh, if the neurosurgeon is required, for example, if there's a bleed, then we send that case to a neurosurgeon as well. So various specialties now are involved in this case, but all and surrounding that case, which is an emergency to deal with, they give their opinion of what is happening and what should be done next to the medical colleague in Afghanistan. And the coordinator takes all that advice back. Um, in this case, it's all life. So the, the chat is going live between their clinical colleagues on both ends. Um, and that patient actually does survive because the advice I've given, what to do next on how, what steps should be taken after the initial management, what is, whether it's the four hours later, six hours later, or, or a, a day later. We had a similar case that came from uh, Syria. It wasn't a road traffic accident, but a similar emergency case, a, a young child who had uh, diabetes, born with diabetes, uh, had diabetes, and, but was in a coma. And they didn't know what the management of that child would be. So that because it's a, such a specialist area, that case came in at night when I was just finishing my emergency department shift. Uh, it, the case came in when I looked at it, I, we immediately sent it to one of our pediatricians, charge specialist. And that pediatrician immediately coordinated an advice on exactly what fluid management that child should have. Uh, even that fluid management for children is so complex that even if you ask me off the top of my head, I'm an emergency medicine physician now, I couldn't tell you. I have to look it up. Yeah. So you can imagine how doctors actually in conflict zones with very few resources have to, to struggle to figure out what to do and what not to do. They send us a video of that child. 
exactly how much fluid were they on, what they had taken, what medication she was on. And this pediatrician actually from Basildon, Dr. Sanjay Rawal, he uh, was my tutor. So he signed up for a teleheal as well. He's still uh, one of our kind volunteers. He was on it and the whole night he was advising. There was another colleague of, uh, of mine, um, colleague of ours actually for teleheal, advising from Canada as well, another pediatrician. So they were both advising on that case. And the next day they sent us a video of that child walking with a cucumber in a wow. house. Uh, and in many instances, a case like this would have ended absolutely in, in, in disastrous uh, consequences. Mm. And for us, it, we were lucky that we had a specialist who could advise on that case. And we've got some of the cases coming with COVID as well. Patients coming in, for example, in, in hospitals in India uh, with severe cases of uh, um, COVID pneumonitis, where the whole lung is what, taken by uh, the virus and but superseded actually by other bacterial infection as well. So very complex cases. And all of that is now discussed with our acute physicians from the British Association of Physicians of Indian Origin, BAPIO, and they give advice. So they also now provide um, virtual ward rounds as well. Every day of the week, we have virtual ward round. They collect the cases and one day, one of our specialist volunteers, he goes live on Zoom and a colleague from one of the hospitals they ask them all these questions they have collected around all these cases. So whatever question they fire at them thousands of miles away here, that doctor tries to answer them. Or well, vice versa, if that doctor is educated by the colleagues on the ground as well. That's how the reverse innovation happens and it keeps happening and the lives are being saved at the same time. I mean, when, when you look back um, and you think about you as that, six-year-old child in the middle of a refugee camp um, who was fighting malaria and then TB and your journey thus far to now coordinating and having started an international organization that is providing life-saving treatment and advice, facilitating reverse education, um, being invited to the Global Hope Coalition, doing trips to uh, New York City and being in the presence of uh, UN leaders and celebrities, having BBC programs about your life and, and the incredible work that you're doing with Ari and Telly Hill. What do you think? Well, <laughs> it's, it's really difficult to put it into words. I think one thing I would say is that um, for me, it's about the mission. For me, it's never about actually my own life. And I think that's something that keeps me going is that the mission is not accomplished. Personally, yes, it was about me to get education and that's something that I treasure all my life, that I managed to escape conflict, I managed to come find safety and then get education. And with my first salary, I bought watches actually from my parents. And that was something that, okay, this is me done now. <laughs> I, I bought gifts from my, especially coming from an Asian family, you have to buy something for your parents with your own salary so they can feel that you have provided. Regardless of all the help, the money I was sending throughout the, <laughs> my early teen and all that, that, that didn't matter. What mattered was that I was a doctor. I was earning a salary and I was, with, the, with that salary, I bought those watches. So that was for me personal satisfaction. But beyond that, everything else was about the bigger vision. Uh, and if that's something that I, if I could advocate to, to listeners here as well, is that the larger the vision, the more inspired you will become the more fire there will be in your belly every morning that you wake up, that you could do something with your talents, you could do something with the, the amazing network of professionals, of colleagues, or friends that you have. And we can't do it on our own as well. That's another lesson that I've learned through, throughout my life is that it's actually with the power of compassion that so many other human beings have. If we tap into it, we, we can actually solve so many big problems in the world. It's not just about the money. It's not about technology. Yes, I am the one of the World Health Organization digital health expert, but I hardly talk about technology. That comes quite at the, at the end of it. It's actually about solving a problem and having that fire in us to be able to solve that problem. I mean, passion. And the bigger that problem, the bigger our vision. So that's the simple formula for innovation from us, which you're doing as well, Rupi, I know you're doing amazing work, but I'd love to hear about your nonprofit organization. And, and you, you're a fellow 
uh, NHS clinical entrepreneur. So I would love to know how you've used innovation as well to, to do that. But to summarize all that for me would be that having that fire that was built or, or that I got um, in, in refugee time, I was lucky to have that early on, to have that seeds of uh, passion in me to become a doctor one day, to be able to heal. And now I keep making that vision bigger, bigger, bigger um, every day. But the, the, the principles are the same. Uh, some days which I have, you know, I'm disappointed, some things don't work out and so on. All I do is just I look through some of the pictures of the refugee time or some people who are suffering from uh, conditions. I look at the reports. It just starts burning that fire back that I can't give up. You know, yeah. I can't. There's so many people who are suffering, not just in conflict zone and low resource countries, back here in the UK as well. There's a lot of inequality when we look at it from inequality and in access to mental health, for example. You know, so many people are suffering as a result of pandemic. They've suffered. Uh, they don't have access. We see it on the but on the tipping end, they come into an emergency department with full-blown crises. We see them trying, attempting very sadly to take their lives, taking overdoses, self-harming. And, and, and that's really heartbreaking for me. And that's something that I, I'm, I'm putting a lot of efforts into now, how to be able to find a solution for that. Unfortunately, the NHS doesn't have the capacity to deal with all these mental health problems that existed before especially after the COVID pandemic, the mental health issues, that's a parallel pandemic that we probably are under, underestimating at the moment, but that is coming to a point that we need to address it. And that's something that keeps me awake at late at night as well, that how I could actually use a similar system to Teleheal, which I've founded now at the Aaron Wellbeing, to be able to connect the mental health experts across the country and maybe later on across the globe to be able to address this mental health issue. It's not easy, but it's something, it's a huge problem. And, and coming back to my initial point, is it's the bigger the problem, the more inspired uh, one can become. But it's small steps. It's small steps every day that we take, whether it's uh, speaking to one expert, to recruiting one person, doing one email or that. This all can be very rewarding, but as long as we are looking at the problem in a bigger scale in a few years' time that we're going to solve. Mate. That's uh, it's that's <laughs> I'm just sort of blown away by your your vision and tenacity throughout your life. You know, it's uh, it's incredible, and it's it's an absolute privilege to to have you on the show and, and talk about your journey. Um, there's so many elements of your story that we just didn't have the time to talk about, but uh, everything's in in the book. And uh, I just wish you the biggest success with uh, both Telehill and uh, the well-being uh, elements as well. And uh, oh, my. Um, my puppy has come to say hi. This is a nutmeg. Oh, <laughs> amazing. Said. What's your puppy's name? <laughs> She's called nutmeg. She's nutmeg. very cheeky. Yeah, oh, nutmeg. Amazing. We have two chihuahuas. Uh, oh, we dear. had two chihuahuas. One was Louis and Pushkin. Um, oh, great. Yeah. Louis, Louis died last year, so we have Pushkin. Nutmeg is absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, she's a she's a cavapoo, and she's um she's very uh, cheeky and naughty. She shouldn't be in here. She just pushed open the door, and so she just came in. The, they always push the door open, no matter where you are. You know, they they, they show so much love. They, I'm really, I'm so I was really against them. actually getting a dog, um, but uh, my my girlfriend uh sit, like managed to convince me last year, and I think it's just the best addition to our household. So it's the best. I'm, I'm so if lucky. I can ask you, Rupi, could you tell? Yeah. Us and the listeners please because you are um, you're talking about me and, and and i'm sorry to the listeners that it's a one-way conversation actually a lot, <laughs> a lot about myself i really wanted to know more about your nonprofit uh, that you're running and I, I know about the amazing work you do here but i wanted to know more i would call you privately about that as well but please tell the listeners yeah <laughs> sure what you're doing. Well, no and your for that as well please Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you so much for, for, for asking me about it. I mean, uh, I'm going to do another podcast episode all about culinary medicine, but the, the, the core vision that I started with in 2017 wasn't novel. It was actually just to copy what they were doing across the pond in the US. So Harvard were actually, I know you've had experience of going to Harvard. Harvard were actually one of the first universities to start a teaching kitchen program for medical students. So they become proficient in not only clinical nutrition, but the practicalities 
uh, and actually the barriers to healthy eating that patients uh, and clinicians themselves actually um, uh, have to deal with. Uh, and that, that sort of coalesced in, into a program called Culinary Medicine, which was licensed by Tulane Medical School in New Orleans. And now they have franchised that across 50 different medical schools in the US. Um, and I had the privilege of visiting uh, Tulane back in 2016, I think it was. And I said to the guy, um, Tim Harlan, who started it, who's a, um, a board certified physician, he's been working in medicine for over 30 years. I said, look, I want to do what you're doing in the UK. And luckily, with, with their guidance and vision, we're able to start something very similar in the UK. And what we're working on now is scaling up um, the culinary medicine concept across different medical schools. We're currently in two. We're just in Bristol and UCL. Um, but we want to make it as part of the compulsory education across all 32 plus medical schools in the UK. So I'm not the only one talking about nutrition. It's a new generation of doctors who know about gastroenterology, who know about uh, anesthesiology and, and respiratory medicine. They also know about nutritional medicine as part of their curricula. So, you know, <clears throat> you were talking about patients who come in, uh, in, in in desperate times. You know, a lot of what we see is uh, the, um, the the sort of uh, uh, the, the end point of type 2 diabetes or poorly managed uh, chronic long-term conditions that unfortunately will result in something like a stroke. You know, we want to try and prevent those from occurring so we don't have to deal with those in, in A&E and actually reduce the risk of everyone. Um, so yeah, th th there is, there's a lot of work to do uh, with coloring medicine and as a nonprofit, um, there's a lot of hurdles that we've had to entertain and I'm sure you, you know a lot more about those than, than myself. But yeah, we're working along, man. Um, and I would love to, you know, uh, try and, and, and help in any way I can with uh, the, your sort of vision with area and well-being as well. It sounds, sounds fan, fan, fantastic. I'm 100% I'm sure you will be able to help and advise. Uh, and I'm so proud of you, Rupi, that you've taken, um, I think in innovation, some people, they may confuse, you know this very well, um, you're a fellow clinical entrepreneur. You know, this innovation is not just about reinventing the wheel. It's not about creating something completely new. Mm -hmm. but you can add value 5 to 10% on top of something so you're innovating you're making things efficient you're making scaling things so you are doing that um, at national level internationally with international collaboration so i really mm -hmm. congratulate you on that i may actually point out that the end point of not looking after nutrition is the effects of it that i, I see it through the charity i see it in conflict zones i see it in low resource countries that people suffer from heart attacks suffer from diabetes from so many other chronic illnesses and acute illnesses because one, they've been either forced or not educated enough to look at the nutrition. Um, I know we talk about um, safety first, but also nutrition is equally important in the long term. All these years of lack of nutrition, all these years of not being able to have good nutrition, quality nutrition, builds up. Uh, and then finally, it's, it's it, it, it's you we see the full-blown crisis whether it's in diabetes we see it in in, in arthritis because of the weight uh, and uh, my mother suffered from it and she passed away last year from cancer but uh, she suffered all her life from uh, high blood pressure she suffered from high cholesterol um and and for really bad knees arthritis as well and a lot of it is actually because of the lack of nutrition not being able to walk to exercise go out and on top of that, the stress as well. Yeah, massive. I think it's the connection between the mind, the body, which is the um, exercise or lack of exercise, nutrition or lack of nutrition or lack of good nutrition, as well as stress uh, and, and mental health issues. They're so interconnected. Uh, and I'd yeah. love to talk to you about more, uh, but I really congratulate you on your amazing work. Please keep it up. Keep inspired. Keep making me inspired. If I can say that I, I'm a really hopeless cook, but whenever I look at your recipes, they absolutely <laughs> away. I show them to my wife. I said, can you make this? <laughs> I can only make some eggs and so on like that. But uh, I asked my wife, can you please do this? Rupi makes it look good. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what, I'll, uh, I promise you, well, I'll definitely cook for you and I'll teach you a few recipes so you can cook for Davina. How about that? Oh, <laughs> I, I love the first part. <laughs> 
being cooked for. I'd love to come. Not sure about you being able to speak English, <laughs> but I can try to learn. So I would, I would like to, to ask the listeners to keep listening to you, to your teaching about nutrition. Uh, it's not just about the amazing recipe, the beautiful recipes you show. There's a lot more behind this. So I hope uh, you'll continue to grow your community. I'm very proud of you. Appreciate that, Reed. And then the same goes for you, buddy. Same goes for you.